how do reimbursement rates for doctor services from the insurer actually influence patient care? That's what we're thinking about in this video. And we're thinking about it from the perspective of a doctor, nurse, team, and perhaps a uh, physician group where we have administrative staff that's hired by the doctor's team. And of course, the insurer is going to reimburse for, say, an hour of the doctor's time, depending on their specialty, for certain procedures, earwax removal, um, an EKG, different tests that can be done, and those reimbursement rates are going to de determine sort of the total revenue of the, um, of the physician group. In fact, let me just label this physician group. Now, one of the main tasks of the admin staff is to code everything. They take the medical records, they code them into uh, CPT codes or ICD-9-CM codes or whatever type of code is appropriate. And they send that bill to the insurance company. The insurance company reimburses it for patient care. Now, I think most doctors are altruistic. They don't want their care to be driven by financial incentives. That wouldn't feel good ethically. That wouldn't make you want to show up every day for your job. So they're just going about their day giving the best patient care possible. In which case, the question is, how can insurance reimbursement rates influence what happens to the patient in the doctor's office? And here's one way this could potentially happen. If the physician's group ends up losing money or perhaps making less money than they expect for a couple years in a row, say, they can tell their administrative staff, would you look into this and see which procedures do we seem to be spending a lot of time doing and not getting much reimbursement rate? Which procedures are we being reimbursed pretty lucratively for? And just have a conversation with us, talk to us in, in you know, the time between patients about what you're seeing. And the administrative staff is going to sort of look through that and figure out, actually, this is super lucrative. Like, we could actually get our numbers up and make more revenue if we just did a little bit more of this type of procedure. And the doctors might be like, that type of procedure can't really hurt. Um, it uses this fancy new technology. And maybe the technology company might have nudged us or, or given us a hint, why don't you look at that? reimbursement rate. We worked really hard to get the reimbursement rate up for insurers. And in which case you can, without hurting patient care, sort of nudge up revenue of the physician group by doing a little bit more of the stuff that is reimbursed most lucratively. Now, at this point, there's not really that much harm to the patients, right? Like, I'm fine with it if this happens with the doctor's office. And actually, now that I'm thinking of it, I think I'm going to add the medical device company as a, a party that's lobbying the insurer about these reimbursement rates, because I think that's going to be a key part of the story here. So the medical device company is going to lobby the insurer to raise reimbursement rates for their particular uh, medical device or for the procedures that go well with their medical device. Okay, so we still have this situation. We're still bumping up some of these procedures that might be associated with new technology that's been lobbied for, um, and but the procedure doesn't harm the patients. We don't have any problem yet with patient care. Here's where a problem can come in. Um, if you have a group like, say, Medicare, that is trying to come up with these reimbursement rates and they want to limit the total increase in their spending for the year. And lots of countries will do this where they'll have a global budget. They'll say medical spending cannot increase more than 3% per year. So when you come up with this, these reimbursement rates, you need to make sure the expected cost of care, given the quantities of services from the previous year, um, don't exceed a 3% increase in cost. Now, you might imagine regular private insurers may have a similar uh, way of doing reimbursement rates because they don't want their insurance prices to go up 10% next year or 20% next year. They would also like to keep costs um, from rising too much at once. 
So in coming up with that list of reimbursement rates, if you've suddenly expanded the amount of this particular procedure that's being done, when they're renegotiating rates next year, they may need to cut somewhere else on the list of reimbursement rates for the doctors. And when they do that, that could actually make some of these other things that were perhaps more medically necessary, less lucrative for the doctor. Now, at this point, the question is, will the doctor stop doing that thing just because it's less lucrative or perhaps just because they're losing a little bit of money from it? Like, aren't they going to say, well, we're making enough money from this new procedure, we can afford to lose money from the other procedure? Um, and I think to some degree that cross reimbursement rate is just assumed we're okay with it, we're not too upset about it unless we start losing money or not getting our expected increase in salary year after year, at least to keep up with inflation. The other thing that can happen here is if there seems to be a procedure that the administrative staff notices is like losing money year after year after year, they can at least tell the doctors that. And maybe when the doctor is with the patient, they'll, they'll have more of a conversation in their brain about whether it's really, really necessary. Like, does this patient really need that procedure? Maybe the really sickest in this category do, but this patient's pretty healthy and they may become more, um, just more careful about who they do and do not give a procedure to if they notice that it's obvious they're losing a lot of money for every one of those procedures they do. Now, so the point I'm trying to make here is that you have this slow evolution over time in what is appropriate care. And that evolution can be influenced by these conversations between the doctors and the nurses and the administrative staff about what types of things seem super lucrative and maybe you should uh, nudge your doctors to do a little bit more of, what kinds of procedures and things are you losing money from on average, in which case maybe you should nudge the doctors to do a little bit less of that. And I think that actually gets integrated into the doctor's perception of appropriate care because it's really about when you're thinking of giving a particular procedure to a patient, how carefully do you think through that? Like, um, do you nudge towards the risks of the procedure if it's uh, perhaps less lucrative or losing you money? Do you think really carefully about who really needs the procedure, which you might do if you're losing money? Or do you um, underemphasize the risks and overemphasize the advantages to nudge up revenue? In which case, those those day-to-day -day decisions that you repeat over and over again can turn into a self-signaling process if you want to use some behavioral economics vocabulary where the signaling to the doctor of what's appropriate care might be based on what do we usually do with patients like this. And maybe you nudged up the probability they get a procedure because at one point that was super lucrative, but that can become, I think, embedded in people's minds as the most appropriate way of treating patients. And all of this happens without doctors who are super financially motivated. Mostly they just care about patients or trying to give appropriate care. It's just that the reimbursement rates may nudge around the edges and slowly shape appropriate care over time, such that nobody ever remembers that this ever happened where this lobbying of the insurer took place and influenced reimbursement rates at the margin.